Uh, kia ora, nā mihi nui ki a koutou katoa, uh, e nā mana whenua ki tēnei rohi, a tēnā koutou katoa, a uh, rauranga tirama, a nā hoe whā, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, greetings everybody, well done for making it to the final session of the day. I think you should actually give yourself a round of applause for that, well done. We, we aim to make this session um, as enlightening and as interactive as possible, uh, and so I'm going to try and make, uh, like, unlike any politician ever, and speak for less than my mandated time at the start before I take on my role as facilitator of this session. For me, there's really three main points that I just wanted to make in my introductory comments. Uh, the theme of today's uh, conference, obviously, or the title of today's conference, is the Just Transition Summit. And traditionally, we've applied the phrase just transition very closely to the low carbon economy and the just transition that's required as we face up to the effects of climate change. But it's been very clear to me for some time that the phrase just transition can and should be equally applied to all of the big changes occurring in our economy, especially those that affect the nature of work. And in 2015 and 2016, um, as part of the opposition Labour Party in New Zealand, we undertook a piece of work called the Future of Work Commission. And out of the Future of Work Commission, we have developed a set of policies and themes, one of which is around the question of a just transition. Because a focus on climate change and a low carbon economy is absolutely essential, but it cannot, in my view, be separated from a focus on a just transition that ensures fairness in the workplace and fairness across the rest of society. So that framing of just transition very much applies for this government to the overall future of work. The second uh, point that I just wanted to make is there has been a lot of uh, material written in recent years about what the future of work will look like. Uh, and we've had studies from around the world that as um, Christopher Luxon likes to say, the robots are coming um, at one end of the spectrum through to the other end of the spectrum that we've always seen change in the world of work. Uh, when the motor car was invented, thousands of blacksmiths in London had to find a new job, and they did, and why should we worry? And as ever, the truth probably lies somewhere in the middle. Certainly the period of technological change that we are going through uh, at the moment is uh, to a greater extent and considerably faster than many uh, of the other changes we've seen. If we compare uh, the fourth, so-called fourth industrial revolution to the, in, the original industrial revolution, we're talking about uh, hundreds of times the scale and tens times uh, the pace at least. So that means that while there has always been change in the workplace, now is the time for us to get ahead of that change to ensure that there are equitable outcomes. Uh, most recently in New Zealand, in terms of uh, studies, the Prime Minister's Business Advisory Council, which Christopher chairs, um, have had a report for them done by McKinsey's that's estimated that in New Zealand, up to 21% of current workforce tasks may be automated by 2030. And while there are few jobs that can be completely automated, many individuals, if not most individuals in the workplace, will need to transition parts of their job as a result of automation. So the impacts of the changing nature of work, if just from technology, are significant and therefore need to be faced up to. The approach that uh, this government has taken is to uh, establish what we think is the foundation of a new social partnership for meeting the issues raised by the future of work. And so upon going, coming into government, we took the themes from our Future of Work Commission and put them in place as the themes for the Future of Work Tripartite Forum. And as Jahan mentioned, I co-chair that with Kirk and Richard. And the four themes of, uh, of that uh, Future of Work uh, Tripartite Forum are the just transition to a low carbon economy. You've heard a lot about that today, but it clearly is a critical element of the future of work. And I know that Minister Woods will speak in a little bit more detail about that uh, straight after this session. The second main work stream and a critical one in any conversation about the future of work is the concept of learning for life. We know now, as we probably have known for some years, that we cannot expect to be in one job for all of our lives. We have to accept that there will be training and retraining throughout our lives, and that that retraining and training needs to be supported by employers and government alongside 
employees. And I know that Christopher will talk a little bit about some of the work that has been done by the Business Advisory Council in that regard as well. Uh, from the point of view of, of the for Future of Work Tripartite Forum, uh, we've undertaken a pilot project with the Manufacturers Network on a skills shift initiative for the manufacturing sector to identify the skill needs for the manufacturing sector by talking to employees, employers, industry training organisations and other training providers about the skill needs for the next two and three decades for the manufacturing sector so that we can begin the training and retraining process now. We see that as a pilot for sectors right across the economy and we look forward to being able to share the results of that pilot soon. Uh, we also have a range of other uh, active labour market policy interventions that are about establishing the framework for learning for life, um, such as He Putama Rangatahi, uh, Mana and Mahi, and the Sector Workforce Engagement Program, all of which are designed to ensure that all groups are able to benefit from learning for life. The third um, stream of work for the Future of Work Tripartite Forum is around the adaptation and adoption of technology. A couple of years ago, there was uh, a survey done as part of the uh, CEO forum uh, that said that 75% of CEOs in New Zealand said adaptation and adoption of technology was their biggest issue, but less than a third had a plan for actually uh, how they would do that. So that piece of work is vitally important. And the fourth and final stream of work for our tripartite forum is around the question of workplace productivity and how we lift workplace productivity in New Zealand using technology, but also using obvious changes around how we involve, to a greater extent, workers in decisions in the workplace. And certainly the panel here have um, had significant involvement in programs like high performance, high engagement, which actually work on the basis that those closest to the problems, closest to the issues, should be involved in finding the solutions for them. And uh, the government is finally coming to the party on high performance, high engagement with three public sector agencies, the Ministry for Social Development, the Department of Conservation and the Department of Corrections now all agreeing to be part of the high performance, high engagement pilot initiatives. So those are the four main themes of our uh, Future of Work Tripartite Forum. But as much as anything for me, the important part of that forum is that we are developing a new social partnership. That we are saying that the responsibility for how we get ahead of the trends in the future of work is a shared one. It is not just government, it is not just businesses, and we are not just going to leave workers to fend for themselves. We will do this together. Because I believe there are huge opportunities in the future of work, just as there are huge opportunities in the transition to a low carbon economy. But if we simply step back and try to believe that market forces will solve this for us, we will see inequality rise. There is the opportunity for us to stop that trend, to turn that around and give opportunity to everybody. I've seen it a number of times on the screen today. No one must be left behind. Well, the only way of ensuring that is a new social partnership where employers, employees and government all take responsibility for that and ensure that the future of work is one where there are opportunities for good, meaningful, well-paid work that is available to everybody. Thank you very much. So, it's my job now to uh, corral the panel that's uh, in front of us here, and I'm going to start at the far end with uh, Christopher. And um, Christopher, you are the chair of the Prime Minister's Business Advisory Council. Uh, you've been giving a lot of thought to this question of the future of work, and particularly the balance between how we view the opportunities and the challenges. I wonder if you want to start us off on that. Yeah, well, I think um, the biggest fear when you hit the topic of automation is that people fundamentally think the robots are coming, it's going to be doom and gloom, uh, we're all going to have, you know, be sitting around doing nothing because the robots are doing all the work. And the reality for us is there are three big opportunities around automation if we can adopt quickly. And the first is that we actually could improve our productivity a lot. And productivity is the value of our sectors divided by the number of people working in them. And essentially, New Zealand has a productivity disease across every sector that we essentially operate within. We're a third lower than the OECD average and we've been declining for some time. 
Um, and if you look at things like manufacturing against the US, we're only 54% as productive as US manufacturing. And if we could adopt automation faster, we think we can improve that to 83% uh, of the US productivity in manufacturing alone. So there's some real benefits in productivity. There's some real benefits in certainly around um, uh, competitiveness. Uh, and all in all, you know, if we get actually on the right curve, we could actually improve incomes from our research by two and a half thousand to eight and a half thousand dollars per person annually uh, through, through getting that, that right. Um, there's actually probably 200,000 new jobs to be created uh, or net, net new jobs to be created off the back of adopting automation quickly. And that is um, pretty exciting. And it is a lot of what Grant was just saying before. And I can tell you at Air New Zealand, you know, we've got six different new jobs that didn't exist six months ago. That's all about uh, robotic process automation. And that's uh, around this automation coming into our business. Those jobs didn't even exist six months ago. So um, I think there's better quality work and, and more interesting work that's quite possible off the back of automation. We introduced at Air New Zealand kiosks, and a lot of people said to me at the time, oh, Chris, you're going to get rid of all those people that are at the front of airports. We want those people. We've kept them. We've added to them because we want them doing the engagement with people stuff, not just the processing of checking you in and out on for your flight. So three big opportunities, three big challenges as you identify, which is really around the skills that we're going to need. We're going to need people with technology skills, cognitive skills, collaboration skills, emotional skills, uh, and those people will be in huge demand. If they have those skills, obviously that can drive the risk of uh, inequality. Uh, and as we go through that transition, we're going to need to support people through it. So the first recommendation off the back of that report was actually a skills pledge. And what it was saying was, we as employers, whether you're in the public sector or private sector, should be making a commitment to reskilling and retraining our people. Why? Because if we actually exit someone out of a business because they don't have the skills to do the new job that's emerging, and we go exit them and then go rehire someone new, that process is two and a half times more expensive than if we could actually take the existing employee and retrain them. And so last week we launched the pledge. Already I'm pleased to say we've had 14 companies, one iwi organization, Ngāti Parau, have come on board. We've got over 100,000 workers represented by these organizations already that are committing to doubling the level of reskilling training hours, publicly reporting them each year uh, between now and 2025. So it's, yeah. I think retraining and reskilling becomes the key way we mitigate those risks. But um, if we can get through the transition, uh, there's a huge prize at the other side of it. Yeah, thanks, Chris. And that, it, it is a, a huge commitment from those organisations to uh, to do that. So yeah. I, you know, a lot of credit to you and the Business Advisory Council for driving that. That's right. I'm sure there'll be other businesses in the room and elsewhere. Who and we'd love public sector too, Grant, because right. there's 400,000 workers that's sitting there. That's right, and <laughs> it's the challenges laid down to us in the public sector to, yeah. to get along. But it's coming. Um, turning to Richard um, Wagster um, from New Zealand <coughs> Council of Trade Unions. Richard, from a worker perspective, um, clearly uh, there is opportunity here, but there's obviously risk. Um, for you, what's the, what's the balance here between looking at this from an individual worker point of view or more from a cross-industry, cross-sector point of view? Yeah, uh, kia ora and th thanks Grant. Well, it's, it's uh, certainly in the front of uh, many workers' minds what the future holds um, in terms of climate, in terms of technology, in terms of demographics, globalisation. And um, what we're inspired by is, is a kind of notion that we hear from the International Labour Organisation who put out a book earlier this year or, or a publication called Working for a Brighter Future, which said, you know, let's aim to make work better, safer, cleaner, more interesting, more secure, higher incomes and so on. But um, we're very realistic that that won't happen by accident, uh, as I think in your opening remarks, we don't think, um, while we think capitalism might find a way, it can be brutal. And we need to rein it in and we need to organise it effectively so that it works for people. And I think um, one of the things here is no one is in this on their own, we're all in this together. And so for us it's important that we actually coordinate voices, obviously workers need to coordinate their voices collectively, whereas effectively they're in a very paternalistic process and they're bound to feel uh, disempowered. And I also think business needs to coordinate as well. Um, because actually this isn't industry by industry, this is, this is region by region, this is nation by nation, this is you know, a global issue. So we need to pull it all together and figure out how we're going to make, to make progress. And I think um, you know, the how we get there is incredibly important because if people can't see themselves in the how, if they can't see that at the end of this there's going to be a bright future, I'll bail on it. And um, 
people will resist change. They'll resist it, so it's sort of like a political equation, both in the workplace as a union, but I think also more broadly and ultimately at the ballot box. If we can't create a process where people feel genuinely engaged, and there's been a lot of discussion about the lack of genuine engagement, if we can't create a process where people can see they can see the future, they can see the bridge to getting there, they can see it'll be safe for them and an opportunity for them. Uh, I, I think they'll resist change and uh, ultimately they'll, they'll, they'll be in denial about the change that needs to happen. And um, we've seen uh, globally the, um, the, uh, you know, the politics around denial uh, and, and populism and I think we really, that's why it's so important we do the how well, because if we don't do the how well, we won't get far at all and um, we'll be living in a, it, will be, there'll be uh, people uh, attracting, you know, um, real resistance and, and leading resistance. So that's absolutely vital. But um, I see it, we're in this together. I think we need to act like we're in this together, and that means giving people real voice on the way through and, a, and an agreed uh, shared ownership of what the future looks like. If we can start with where we're going and, and uh, hold each other's hands on the way through, we have a much better chance than just leaving it to, um, leaving it to the market. Thanks, Richard. Uh, Jenny Cameron uh, from uh, Dairy NZ. Uh, I think when people, a lot of people think about the future of work and these changes, they have in mind somebody in an urban setting and if, you know, maybe in a factory losing their job, but obviously this has got huge impact in the rural sector as well. Thank you. Uh, yes, and I think I've been looking at it in terms of uh, there's two ways. There's the mindset around future of work and how work's going to change and then there's the jobs themselves. In terms of that mindset, I think when people think of farming, they tend to think of just the farmers on the farm, but for every on-farm job, there are four jobs in rural communities and in the wider economy that are impacted. So when we're going through the future of work and thinking of change, it's about thinking of all those other jobs that are also needing to help the farming sector transition, the rural professionals, the business advisors, the banks, um, the the uh, manufacturing suppliers and all of the other related industries that will help sam support transition. In terms of the jobs themselves, it's certainly something at Dairy NZ we've been doing a lot of work and thinking on, of uh, looking at how robotics mm -hmm. might come into the sector. I mean, New Zealand's already, where we use a lot of automation that people might not be aware of already in, in um, the farming sector. We were big um, adopters of the uh, motorised rotating milking platform that was hugely innovative in its time. Um, all the, the tags in, in the cow's ears can be used to help identify if uh, an animal is sick or um, is needing extra attention and the gates will automatically move them so that they can go out. All of those things are saving time and resource and energy for the farmer to be able to be really efficient. Um, but the one thing that we do need is to get really smart and clever people into the farming sector because there's a lots of challenges but also huge opportunities with the challenges that we're facing to, to meet um, a low emissions uh, economy future. And so we want to make sure that we keep getting really good and smart, clever people coming into our rural um, economies and rural sectors. Because the way we farm now is not the way we farmed 30 years ago, and we're very sure it's not going to be the way that we farm in 30 years' time. Uh, and that there's a lot of uh, technology being used, and we want to make sure that it's um, keeping on as the future of work comes through. Okay, thanks. Uh, Tony, firstly, um, welcome. Thanks for, for coming um, over the ditch to see us. Um, from a CFMEU point of view, or even your own, obviously the mining sector is one that experiences these changes in two, uh, two ways. One is around the, the transition to a low carbon economy and the impact that has on, on your members, your workforce, but also in automation as well. Clearly both of those are there. So I wonder if you could share a bit of your experience with, uh, I guess your lived experience with how those two factors have impacted the sector. Yeah. Um, so yeah, thanks for inviting me. Uh, look, the electricity industry, the transition's already underway. Um, it's only a question of whether or not it will be a just transition. Um, and that's where we all need to work together to make that happen. I mean, we actually love the sound of the German system that was outlined this morning, where no one is left behind. They literally all get to retirement or near retirement or get bridging finance, um, or they're placed in decent work. So that's the way to do it, with long-term planning. 
In the electricity sector, it's happening, in Australia, it's happening haphazardly. There's already been eight stations closed uh, and associated mines. Um, inevitably, when they're privately owned, the decisions are made with about three months' notice, um, and, uh, and they're a disaster. Um, a third uh, get decent jobs, a third get uh, insecure, low-paid jobs, and a third never work again. Uh, that's the experience in Australia. Um, what we did with the last big power station closure, which was Hazelwood, owned by the French giant, Onji, they gave us four months' notice. Um, they made a decision in Paris. Uh, a thousand people were affected. Um, I went to the Victorian government, it was a Labor government, and they agreed to have a worker transfer scheme to the remaining three power or four power stations and three mines, um, but it had to be voluntary. And to get the uh, companies to participate, they insisted on controlling the employment arrangements. So we had an expression of interest for workers in those mines and power stations uh, who wanted to take a voluntary redundancy package that the Victorian government was paying half of. Um, and, uh, and that would have taken all the Hazelwood workers that wanted a job. <laughs> but the, the companies, for their own reasons, uh, only allowed about 100 to go. So uh, that was a good step forward, but um, not exactly the German model. So. <laughs> Uh, in November last year, a bloke called Bill Shorten, who you may be hearing more of shortly, um, announced the energy policy for Labor, and uh, in it we will set up a statutory authority for just transition in the coal-fired electricity sector. Uh, and that could about 8,000 employees in that sector, uh, and uh, that's, they'll have two tasks. One is to oversee um, pooled redundancy schemes, and it'll be compulsory to participate, none of this voluntary stuff. Um, and the other thing is that it will recommend to government uh, investments for economic diversification. Because the truth is that just transition and economic diversification is the only way you can share the burden. Don't let anyone tell you that there's not a cost to transition. There is, and we can either lump it all in the regions that are exposed to um, emissions intensive industries, where you will destroy the communities um, with uh, crashing housing prices, uh, all sorts of social dysfunction, uh, you take all that income out of the community, uh, multi-generational unemployment. Uh, you can have that or society can step in and spread the costs. Uh, and that's actually what we mean by just transition. On the question of, um, I should say, the next power station to close in 2022 is owned by AGL in the Hunter Valley. They've already agreed to no forced redundancies. They've got a neighbouring power station. They're going to employ people uh, in the battery park, in the gas turbine. Uh, so, it, it, you know, business is there. This is about making all, all businesses step up to the mark. So, it, but it's in that sector. Consider it a pilot program. On automation, Rio Tinto in the iron ore mines, they employ about 8,000 people in eight different mines. They've had, had for 10 years an autom automation and remote operations program. A number of their big trucks, really big trucks, are operated not at the mine, but from a uh, remote operations centre near Perth Airport, 1,500 kilometres away, uh, with joysticks and computer screens instead of steering wheels and cabins. And they've been doing that for a fair long time. They've got about 1,000 people employed down there. Some of them were the workers transferred from the trucks themselves. Others were people who come in with a new skill set. The challenge there is to get through it again with no forced redundancies. And the smart companies like Rio, and they are smart companies, we've had plenty of fights with them, they're a very smart company. Um, <laughs> they get that their social licence to operate is actually dependent on producing royalties for governments and regional employment for communities. So they don't want a reputation where they kick out all the old school miners. They're committed to that sort of retraining that you're mm. talking about. So automation is a challenge. They've also, can I just make one other example? They've also introduced, after 10 years and a billion dollars of investment, autonomous trains. So these 2.4 kilometre uh, trains carrying iron ore to the port, um, they're operated without any crew. Now, um, it took them two years to perfect it. We used to have 450 workers in the rail crew, because uh, it's a big operation. We've still got 400 when there's no crew required. The crew, the 400, and that we got there without forced redundancies, uh, are dotted along the line because in the early stages of, of automation, they will break down. You know, when you get a train that long going up a hill, 
and, and it's pushing and the other one's breaking going down the hill, it creates some technical problems. So that will, over time, less people will be required. But consider this. Some people say 30% less uh, jobs will be available in those mines um, after they finally roll out all these automation and remote operations plants. You know what? There's 254,000 jobs, uh, direct jobs in Australia in mining alone, many more indirect jobs. Um, there's still going, still going to be a big employer. The, the question is getting, getting the existing workforce and the future workforce aligned with the skills necessary. Mm. It's a challenge for business, it's a challenge for governments, and it's a challenge for unions. Very good. Thanks, Tony. Um, Kirk Hope um, from Business New Zealand. Kirk, you, I know, as part of the work you've done, you've been off to Singapore and, and had a look at what's going on over there, and particularly the issue around the importance of lifelong learning and, and industry planning. Do you want to tell us a bit about the business perspective on that? Yeah, yeah sure. And it sort of covers a couple of things that, um, that Tony and, and Christopher have already talked about, actually. The, the cost for you know making workers redundant versus reskilling and retraining them is significant. So and and you'll build considerable loyalty within your workforce by uh, having a very effective mechanism for reskilling and retraining. One of the challenges that we kind of we have in New Zealand, but um, we what's being faced all over the globe actually is that we've got an education system uh, that's really built been built for an industrial economy and. And everyone across the world is grappling with how they can transition uh, this, this education system to enable uh, much quicker recognition of, uh, much quicker development of and recognition of uh, skills, uh, but also the ability to record those skills so that they're translatable into, into other environments. So, so, so just to sort of um, use a live example of what Tony was talking about, someone who has been working in a mine has a particular set of skills. What you want to be able to do is reflect what those skills are, how many of those are translatable into a new particular type of job, and then figure out what additional skills that person will need for the new type of job. Um, in Singapore, uh, they've, 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 um, just to give you an idea and a sense of the scale of financial investment they've made in it, sorry, mate. Um, <laughs> you know, so social partnership. Yeah, yeah that's, that's exactly <laughs> right. That's, for, they've, they've spent about four and a half billion dollars um, mapping 20, uh, providing industry maps for 23 industries. Uh, that will be a skills assessment across those industries and how those skills will change over time and how those workers uh, uh, effectively can be, if you like, tagged in terms of the skills that they have and the skills that they'll need within a specific time frame. It's an incredibly systematic approach. It's not necessarily going to be the way for New Zealand, but you know what, it's a really good example that we can, uh, we can start to build uh, more on and think more about. One of the big gaps, in it, I think, in, in our process in terms of lifelong learning is understanding what, what learning has happened in the workplace. We know that that's not very well recorded or reflected uh, in our current education system, though it is happening. Some would say it's not happening enough, and, and you know, I'd, I'd probably agree with that. But what we have to do is get more systematic about that so that we can have a very clear picture of... Um, of what, what will be needed, what skills will be needed for, for people as they transition. I'll, I'll just, we'll come to some Slido questions in a second, but I just want to follow up a couple of points, and I might just start, Kurt, with you. I, I, you know, I, I certainly know from having worked with you and Richard as we've gone through the, um, the Future of Work Tripartite Forum, you've got a real commitment to this. I just wonder from an individual business perspective, people are busy mm. in their own lives, they're just you know, trying to make ends meet, they're worried about the monthly bills. What is it that's going to help employers get ahead of this, recognise that, they, that they've got a role and responsibility and that they'll benefit from it? Is there, is there something that we're missing here? Is there, is there support? I often hear that it's, it's time. Time is the biggest issue, particularly in smaller businesses, I guess, as well. But what is it that's going to help employers get over the line to be part of things like Christopher's Pledge or, or that? What, what will it take? Yeah, actually, uh, um, it, it won't take a huge amount, but one, th one thing I would commend the government for in, in terms of the review of uh, vocational education at the moment, one is actually the accessibility for businesses into vocation, uh, specifically vocational education, and that system, and even, even into schools, really, having a more systematic approach to that, um, because we haven't. It yeah. really falls on you know, individual business owners uh, and, and principals of schools 
and um, you know account managers within polytechnics, for example, we need to kind of have a, a much more systematized approach to it. And it's possible in the current environment we have with, with the technologies that are available, so that it's really easy for that business owner to say, um, have, a, have a very clear pathway about what their business looks like from a strategic perspective and then say, right, I know, that I know in two or six or ten months time I'm going to need these skills and here's where I'm going to be able to access those skills or how, here's how I'm going to help my people be able to access those skills. Mm. Graham, I think the, um, we see this for business like often, you know, there's lots of other co-benefits but one of the big benefits around financial success. So. If I look at small, medium enterprises, it's 73% of the New Zealand business environment. But we can see in the research that small, medium enterprises that actually use <coughs> you know, three or more cloud-based apps to run their business and embrace automation more have 30% greater profitability than those that don't. So even it's a big compelling case even for SMEs, let alone for big, large employers like us with 12,500 workers where the two and a half times extra cost of you know, getting rid of these people and hiring these people just doesn't make a lot of sense, mm -hmm. right? So, um, yeah, I think that, that that's yes, some of the motivation and incentives, you know. I just want to get you and Richard, if, if you don't mind, have it do your double act on high performance, high engagement, because we talk a lot about learning for mm -hmm. life and skills, and that's obviously a huge part of, of the future of work, but so is how workplace productivity can be improved and also give people more of a stake in their workforce. So I just wonder for people who don't know a lot about HPHE, if we mm. could do the, the sort of 90 <laughs> seconds each on, yep. on what it is. Yep. Uh, well, perhaps I'll make a start, and it's highly relevant actually to all change. It's effectively a method for uh, truly engaging people uh, in the change process. And um, uh, it's a way of, rather than asking, say, I, we've heard this earlier today, rather than saying, <coughs> And, and from our point of view, the employer saying, uh, here's a problem, what do you think of the solutions? Or here's a problem, this is my idea to fix it, what do you think? It actually engages uh, everyone in what is the problem or what is the issue we're dealing with at the very beginning. So it's taking a step back and it uses, um, you know, sort of methods of root cause analysis, problem solving, interest-based bargaining, whatever, all these kinds of methods, or possibly even lean, um, whatever, people think themselves uh, will actually solve this problem there. So there's a lot of training in it, so people understand how to apply it. Uh, and then the, the point is to try to reach as far as possible consensus on the solutions. And it's done within an environment where um, there shouldn't be people worried about their jobs, uh, and also there should be a commitment to sharing the, the benefits of the outcomes. Uh, from our point of view, that if we create a culture of work uh, where there is truly a lot more voice of working people, there are massive uh, improvements in efficiency and safety and all those things to be gained, mm. uh, as opposed to the command and control kind of approach to work. And I think it goes for more broadly, you know, as a society or as a community facing change, we need that kind of spirit of c and culture. Mm. Yeah, I mean, from my point of view as a CEO of, of, of a larger company, I mean, when we started eight years ago, Mitch and I started talking about this, was that, you know, we had written probably 30% of the industrial relations law in this country between punch-ups between Air New Zealand and, and its respective unions. Um, <coughs> and that punch and duty show is very interesting and curious for a while, but you get a bit sick of it after a while because it's quite tactical and transactional and you don't actually get to any of the strategic challenges that you're facing as a business. So rather than sort of sitting there in, in your office and dreaming up the solution and dropping the blueprint on, on workers, um, we realised actually the workers closest to the problem actually have the solution. Um, we were just meeting yesterday with the union heads, weren't we? And we were just mm. saying it's yeah. a big commitment, though, in terms of how you have to engage, collaborate, talk. You go forward, you go backwards. A lot of it's about trust. But mm. now, sitting where we sit, <coughs> you know, Air New Zealand has culture scores in the top quartile of the best companies globally. Um, you know, sixty-two percent of this country want to work here. We have really high levels of, you know, staff engagement uh, as a consequence. So. Mm. We would say that's highly valuable to us uh, in a business sense. We want to deliver superior commercial returns and outstanding customer uh, outcomes, but also really have high cultural outcomes. And so those three bits work together for us, yeah. and HPE has been a big part of it. And, and I think just to add to that too, it, you can't just put out a <coughs> memo and say start talking to each other well or, or, mm. or read a book. It actually has to be learned. And I think um, in terms of um, us more broadly uh, transitioning justly to a, to a good future, uh, I actually think there's a, a big role for the state to play in coordinating and, um, ins and insisting on a proper method uh, where everyone really feels talked to, not just go and look at the website, but we really provide for genuine um, discussions and genuine 
uh, engagement with people, you know, face to face as well as in all the other ways. Sorry, Jenny, you want oh, to add something? Yes, to that? I just uh, something to add in terms of from the rural sector and what Kirk was saying around um, lifelong learning and the model of education. Uh, it doesn't necessarily work so well when you do lots of on-the-job training. And at DairyNZ, we've been doing a lot of talking with our farmers around what uh, their needs are in terms of that uh, mm. lifelong learning and looking more and more at how you can slot in um, recognising and appreciating the work, uh, sorry, the knowledge that you gain through work and then looking at what modules or other needs you might have and then how you can access those. So we're very supportive of this review of vocational education because we think this is a really good time to push the reset button on what our needs in the primary sector are and not just looking at, right, you've got to be dairy, you've got to be beef, you've got to be hort, but very much looking as um, farmers farm the land and the land, um, land use can change, land use will change. We've, we're very much that diversification of land use will be part of our future. So what are the skills that they need that they currently have, because farmers have got a lot of, they, they get up in the morning, they work with animals, they have to manage people, and they have to be environmental managers more and more now, and, that though, and work with the technology they've got. So what are the skill set they've got, and then how um, they can then use that into other areas as they go. And the other point is, um, we've heard a lot about that social justice. I think um, equity uh, around not all farmers are the same, obvious point that needs to be said. And so you've got people at different ends of the bell curve, but also different ends, um, different grades of land. And so the needs uh, will be very different depending on what type of land you've got. And that's a really important thing as we go through how we're going to um, manage the skills that are needed. Cool. All right, we might come to some uh, of the Slido questions. And happily for me, the first one is for me. Um, and, and it asks whether the government is going to commit to rep replacing every <coughs> lost job with another decent paying job on at least a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, targets and setting targets is a topic of great interest to the government right at the moment, so I'm not going to sit on the stage today and commit uh, absolutely to, uh, to that. What I would say, though, is I do think the government has an obligation to be supporting uh, every worker in the transition to future jobs and the development and obtaining of, of new skills. That's why, in part, uh, the government introduced the, the fees-free program, which is about making sure that everyone as a school lever or as somebody who has never been in post-secondary school training and education before has that opportunity. And our goal is to expand on that, to make sure that we are developing the, the, the skills and the, and the attributes for people so that they can transition from one job to another. But one of the other reasons why I don't like to commit to something like that is that I think if you look one and two decades ahead into the future of work, we need to have a rethink about the way work is organised and the extent to which people at different times in their lives will work for somebody else, mm. will work for themselves, will work in a cooperative, that, uh, those different forms and styles of work mean that I think as time goes on, um, making those sort of one-to-one -one comparisons isn't, uh, isn't probably going to be reflective of the world of work that, um, that we're entering into. So the absolute commitment from the government is to support the creation of decent, high-paying jobs to make sure that we give people the skills and attributes they need to move through transition and to make sure that we're supporting businesses to be able to create that. But unfortunately for Sam, today I'm not going to commit to a, a t another target for the government. Moving swiftly on, uh, the second question we've got is really, it says, what role can targeted workforce training and capability enhancement at entry trades and professional levels play? And I'll open this one up for anyone. This is really the question of the balance between specific workplace-based training and getting the skills that are transferable and the way that we balance those two together. Um, I think there's a legitimate question to be mm. asked here. Mm. We know that workplace-based training can be important and useful not only for workers but for the productivity of the workplace, but clearly in a rapidly evolving working environment, uh, 
workers need skills that are transferable. So anyone want to comment on the balance of those two things, Richard? I'll, I'll make a couple of comments. One is just about in every conversation education, we always get to education and training. It, it all roads seem to lead to this Rome. Um, and for us, workplace training is extremely important and, uh, because if we're talking about a constantly changing world, it's about ever, ever long life learning. Um, and um, we, that's partly why we're really keen that industries coordinate and don't sort of selfishly think of themselves and their own staff. And um, people say, if I train people and they leave, you know, I've lost them. Although we tend to say, what well, if you don't train people and they don't leave, um, you've got them. Um, so we really need to, to get our head around that. Um, one of the things about training that we're keen to inject into it too is not just the um, supply of training and the availability of training, but actually the demand for training. That is really um, working with unions and, and, and workers about um, being hungry for training and understanding the opportunity and providing it in paid time and, and for people to understand, um, to, to want to have it. There's no point in producing it and there being nobody who wants to consume it. And so it's a whole system, as many people have said. We really need to think of both ends of the system, not just the pushing it out, but the consuming mm -hmm. it at the other end. And I think it's really important workers are part of the, uh, of the thinking around how you do that best. Yeah, yeah I mean, <coughs> I think the, cr the critical thing is, is clearly workplace-based training is, is an important part of, of skilling. Um, but as I said earlier, what we haven't really been good at is understanding, reflecting, and recording what those skills are, making them... Uh, portable or enabling them to be portable and I think that's a really critical feature of any nimble um, uh, lifelong learning system uh, so that y y anyone can really have a very clear picture of what, what someone's skills are and what they aren't. Um, uh, Tony, I just want to throw to you an element of this question which is you talked about you know, some, of the, some of the attempts to find ways of getting ahead of closures of mines. What's the, what's the balance here between being aware that you're in a sector that's changing completely and actually getting the training as a regularised thing rather than a response to closure? Yeah, um, it, is, it is a challenge. Um, the, uh, I mean, if you, if you take uh, what happened in Germany, um, a lot of the people got jobs at other mines and they already had the skills for them. The challenge really became when um, they were starting to get employment in airports yeah. and nursing homes and needed additional training, but what I understand they did <coughs> was they made sure that training was done before yeah. they finished their time at the mine. So I think that's, whereas the traditional English speaking world approach, let's be frank, um, is sack them and forget them. <laughs> and uh, they can do, so, we'll pro provide a few million dollars for training after you've been sacked. <laughs> um, that's what we do, you know, yeah. and it's, it's broken. And the, and the lesson there is, is that there's some concepts that got a, a bad name a few decades ago, like workforce planning and active labour market policies. And it seems to me that one of the major lessons from any conversation about the future of work is none of us know exactly what that future is, but what we can do is get ahead of the curve, um, bring together all of the people who are in a sector and start making the plans as you say, before someone gets sacked, but is actually in a position to, uh, to get ahead of it. Um, the clock's counting right down on us now, so um, I just want to thank all of you for, for being part of this discussion. There are a lot of new and innovative ideas that are out there in the future of work space, but every conversation about the future of work ends up back at the question of education, mm. skills, training, and making sure that we actually give people uh, the confidence to face the changes that are in front of you. And I hope you've heard today from a group of people who are all uh, committed to that. So please join me in thanking our panel. Thank you. Thank you.